Hey everyone, welcome back to Today in Tech. I'm Julia Beauchamp. I'm here with Computer World Executive Editor Ken Mingus, as well as Computer World Senior Reporter Lucas Mirian. Today we're talking the future of passwords, so stick around. All right, Lucas, thank you so much for joining us today. So we're talking future of passwords. We all we all know and love passwords. Perhaps we know and I'm hate them. I'm not sure them. that I love them. I, you, perhaps we know and hate them. I will tolerate them, but they are they are useful. Yeah, of, of course. And <laughs> you, one may even say necessary. Yeah. But there's obvious password protocols that we all know. We're not supposed to use the same password for everything. Um, your password shouldn't be password or one, one two, two, three, four. four. Yep. Yeah. That's why I've added a five. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Works every time. Live in large. <laughs> but let's talk a little about what the Fido Alliance is and why Apple has been the most recent company to join it. So tell us a little bit about that. Uh, it's a fast online identity alliance, and basically what they're doing is trying to eliminate passwords altogether by using two-factor authentication. And we all probably have dealt with two-factor authentication in one form or another mm -hmm. in our lives. So take a cell phone, that, uh, for a smartphone, for example. You're logging into your bank account, and the bank account uh, server challenges you to give a biometric code, such as a fingerprint scan or facial recognition, or it might even send you a request for a PIN. And it might send you that information via a message or an email, and then you have to type that PIN in. So that's the second factor authentication. So it recognizes the device you're using. That's one. And then second one is the challenge, the, the uh, public private key in, uh, challenge to that device that you then have to answer either via a, a biometric reader or by entering a PIN. Is this a situation, Lucas, and this is what it seems like to me, where technology has finally caught up in a way that with like facial scans or thumbprints, fingerprint scans, which are theoretically more inherently secure than just a memorized code, now that we've got that, especially on mobile devices, that you know this is where why we're going into a different direction with passwords. Absolutely. That's I mean, basically, you become the password, it, your that, face. That's is, exactly it. I mean, unless you're talking about a, a PIN, and that's... We've had that capability for a long time, where they can, where a server can send you a challenge uh, by offering you a PIN number that you then have to enter in, my random PIN number. Um, but it's it has to do with, as I said before, public-private key um, uh, 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 encryption. And uh, but you're right, you're correct in, as far as being able to use a, a biometric scanner to do this. Okay. We haven't had that in the past. Okay, so it's technology is catching up and basically yeah. being able to advance where passwords are going. Exactly, and and I think we were talking uh, yesterday. Uh, Verizon recently came out with their mobile security report. And uh, there's some pretty startling statistics. I was really surprised. Yeah, that story is online right now in Computer World if you want to take a look at it. This is the uh, third Verizon Mobile Security Index right. study. Yeah. I yeah. got that right. So what, uh, what were you finding there? What did they find? Uh, one of the things is that 81% of all security vulnerabilities, all, all hacks, are, are related to either uh, insecure passwords, poor passwords, or stolen passwords. Wow. Um, either through phishing attacks or, or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So passwords really are a vulnerable method of securing a device. Yeah. And that's what that's what FIDO is trying to get rid of. And there are a lot of there's a lot of industry support behind that. Um, I've got a list of members that go from Amazon, Facebook, Google, Intel, Microsoft, VMware, and then you have financial service companies like Amex and MasterCard and PayPal and Visa, and they're all joining this industry standards group in order to improve security and actually make it a lot easier for you to log into their websites and applications. Well, easier and more secure. Yeah, because yeah, I was just about to say, the argument for multi-factor is that you know you have these perhaps inherently insecure passwords or your password's exposed in a massive data breach. And if you have multi-factor enabled, you have... If, even if someone has your login information, they still have to have that code that's texted to you or emailed to you. Mm -hmm. But that can sometimes be a little clunky. So how is the FIDO Alliance aiming to sort of make it more seamless to have multi-factor authentication. Well, one example I gave you was just that, the fingerprint Sure, scan. of course, yeah. So, for example, when I log into my bank, um, the first, uh, I'm already registered, and that's one of the prerequisites of yes. using this, this authentication, me authentication method is to first log into, a, to, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, first register with a site or service, and then once you're registered, that's when it can start happening. That's when it recognizes the device that you've used to register and the information you've given it to register that device. So when now I log, when I log into my bank, 
uh, my bank automatically uh, on my mobile device, for example. I bring up the application, the bank application on my phone, and it immediately asks me to scan my fingerprint. So first it recognizes the device that I'm using, and then secondly it recognizes I'm the owner of that device and the bank account holder through that fingerprint. Now I'm logged into my bank. That's much more simple than me having to go in there and type in my username and my password, and it's more secure because it's covered by encryption. Right, and then you don't have to go back, figure out what the code they texted you was. Exactly. <clears throat> Yeah, it's interesting too. One of the things that uh, you had written about when when this Apple Fido tie up uh, first came out was that there's this whole movement to also try to build this into browsers. I think it's the uh, Web Authentication API. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so it's already supported uh, t to differing degrees by um, uh, Google Chrome, Firefox, and Microsoft's Edge. Right. So it, you, we are going to be seeing this with browsers as well to log in. So the idea being that if you try to log into a site on a desktop using a browser, the browser will also do the same sort of thing where it's, it's first checking to make sure that this, this device, this computer, laptop, whatever, is registered. And then once it does, it can kick off that sort of extra layer of security when you're trying to log in, whether it's a, you know, a text or some sort of message or some sort of way of proving you're you. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, got it. And you can imagine how this might improve security uh, for well, in all sorts of ways. I'm not saying that it will, but there are possibilities to improve security by because now it knows who is logging into that site because mm -hmm. you've pre-registered. So why now? What was the draw for Apple to join the Fido Alliance now? Like you said, there's so many other enterprises that have been a part of it for years. Yeah. So what was the... What was the motivation here? Apple isn't a big joiner. <laughs> <laughs> they are, but always late. They never always join late. first. They always yeah. wait for everybody They're else to join very first. Very slow. They like to do their own protocols, you know, uh, i.e. Lightning. Um, actually, sure. that's probably Intel, isn't it? Or what is it, Lightning Intel? Oh. And they adopted it, or do you I mean the Lightning connector? Yeah. I don't, mm, I'm not I don't sure. know. I, I think that was. I thought that was Apple. It's probably Apple. I'm going to yeah, prove my ignorance Apple. here. Which yeah, I know often, Intel but. invents you know 90 percent of the stuff, and then it's adopted yeah. by one company. But right. um, yeah, it's it's. Uh, but but that's a good example of you know you're not going to see the Lightning connector on other devices. They like to use their own protocols, so uh, they're they're late in the process, and it's still unusual for them because they're not big multi-vendor standard consortium joiners. Um, but I think that they saw the, the groundswell behind this one. And, you know, I think, honestly, they, they believe it's a good standard uh, for authentication. Any sense um, whether or not, you know, obviously the, the idea of security in mobile devices comes up a lot when you, in, corp, in corporate land when you're trying to manage all these devices. Is there any sense, and this may be beyond what you've reported on so mm -hmm. far, but I'm just curious if you know, uh, that something like, you know, the multi-factor authentication that we're seeing roll out is going to lead to more secure devices at work, making them easier to, to basically provision and, and manage. Yeah, that's actually another trend that's going on. Um, I've written about uh, universal enterprise endpoint management software, UEM, UEM uh, that basically manages all your endpoints, so from laptops and desktops to mobile devices and you know, what tablets, whatever. Um, and companies like MobileIron are now incorporating the same security they had for desktops into uh, the UEM software for all endpoints. So I think eventually, yeah, you're going to see this for corporate use as well to secure uh, worker devices. Got it. Okay. And it's it's kind of brilliant. I mean, it's it's a great way of doing it because each corporation can have its own public-private key authentication. So basically, the only people who'd be able to access services at that company would be employees who have been already vetted, basically, vetted. and allowed mm -hmm. in. Exactly. Yeah, and it's an open standard, so uh, developers can can use can, can can modify it for whatever uses they need. Okay. This now we we were talking you know before we went on the air about the idea of I, I was asking how does this relate to zero trust and what is zero trust? I mean I know that's not exactly a specific to passwords, but it is about security and levels of security. Could you just talk for a second about what zero trust is and how that fig figures into this? Sure. So zero trust basically means uh, to put a very high level. Let's say that I'm an authorized uh, a worker who's authorized to log in to a corporate system. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say it's a database. But while I'm in that database, I start to do something that's outside the security parameters. Like I want to copy and paste information in that database and then email it to somebody. And that's not something I'm supposed that's to be. Probably a no-no. That's a no-no. <laughs> yeah. uh, 
what zero trust does is it uses machine learning and artificial intelligence to recognize my behavior and then either warn me or completely shut me down so log me right out of that site so it actually watches you as you're logged in to make sure that you're not doing things that are outside the perimeter parameters of that company's security protocols. Okay, so zero trust basically is sort of an adjunct to the, w once you're in and you've been authenticated and proved that you're you, that's yes. a next layer above it that's AI ML sort mm -hmm. of powered to watch what you're doing. Exactly. And sort of wall you off from things and either stop you or warn you if you try to do something it doesn't think you should be allowed to it's do. It's like the soup Nazi. Okay. So he. But so powerful, everybody but has can get the soup, but you know if you don't if you don't meet you don't, those standards, you know it's the right way. No soup for no you. No soup for you. No data for you. <laughs> no data exactly. for you. So transitioning a little bit back to sort of these security keys, obviously the like you said, Lucas, the biometric keys are pretty common and commonplace for anyone, like you said, with a bank account. We're all probably kind of used to them, but I'm a little more interested in to learn about how enterprises are going to implement this. I mean, not all physical laptop devices, here's mine off camera, has a, a biometric yeah. <laughs> ability. So what are some other ways that they can implement security keys? So we did talk about the pin already, so yeah. a challenge. Okay. Uh, the other one is they've got this cool little um, USB dongle. Uh, mm -hmm. Companies or uh, third parties are creating these dongles that you can plug into a USB port and press a little button, and it gives it offers up the private key to the public key challenge to log you in. Okay. The other cool thing about the dongle is that if you lose your password, it can help you recover it by doing the same by plugging into the USB port, pushing the little button, and authenticating you. Mm -hmm. That's the other method. So I want to know how far away are we from this being? A, completely commonplace, and B, from never having to type in another password ever again. <laughs> yes, that would be nice. Right now, there it's it's an option on a lot of these sites. Mm -hmm. So, uh, But I think uh, it will gain traction over the next two to three years. And I'm hoping, you know, over the next one to five years, we won't ever have to use passwords again. Well, it is interesting, you know, when you think about mobile devices in particular with, like, Face ID. Yeah. There are a lot of sites now that, because I'm logged in on my phone, you know, the first thing it does when I go to log in is does a face scan. Yeah. So clearly, you know, and I have a feeling as a lot of these things sort of emerge from, from you know, users at home who are bringing their devices in, mobile devices is where it's going to start before it spreads. You That's know? a good point. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I really love it. I mean, from my bank account, uh, I, I immediately signed up for it, and it makes it so much easier. It's mm -hmm. when you're on a mobile device, you don't want to have – I hate, first of all, I don't know how um, – I, I hate to say millennials, but I'm going to say millennials. Okay, boomer. It's true. Okay, boomer. It. Okay, there boomer. we go. Okay, boomer. They type so fast, but I'm sitting there. I'm a picker. And w, w, w. I don't want to pick my dot. name and password into a mobile device in order to log into my <laughs> bank account. So it's so nice to just be able to do a quick thumb scan. And okay, great. And be in. I know, yeah, right? Yeah, it's like, uh, you, know, you kids, get off my password. But I know biometrics. For the, <laughs> for the record, as a millennial, yes, I type fast, but also I enjoy Face ID. I like yeah. Face ID. I think I might almost be a Gen Z. So there you go. <laughs> Any other thoughts before we uh, let you go about the future of uh, passwords and where we're going? I, I just I think this is a really smart technology, and, it, and I understand why all of these um, kind of industry bellwether companies are joining, uh, and it makes a lot of sense, especially in light of some of the information we just saw out of the Verizon Mobile Security Threat Report. Yeah. Um, it's shocking. I mean, I, we one of the things in the report was that f I think it was four out of ten companies sacrificed. Yeah. Yeah, they sacrifice security for things like making sure they, they, they achieve revenue. To save some money. Wow. Yeah, save some and money. And save some time. And yeah, and because it's complex, security can be complex. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So obviously more security is going to be a good thing. Especially something that's simple to use. You know, you have to make it easy to use or people aren't going to use it. Oh, yeah. Got it. Yeah. Good point. Did you have any other thoughts, too? Or? That's all for me. Yeah. Okay, well, quick uh, quick programming note. Lucas is going to be sliding over to the IDC side of the company very shortly. So the next time we have him on, he'll be a research analyst studying, uh, learning storage about... Storage infrastructure software. Your first love yeah, storage. You've always storage. loved storage. I have. You know, uh, people chided me when I first started coming in. Oh, you got the storage beat. But you know what? I, I really... It, storage is, is evolving faster than processors. That's cool. It always has. Wow. And okay. I, so I think that's more interesting uh, not more interesting, I shouldn't say it, but just as interesting. To you, it's more interesting. It is. It's more interesting to me. Um, and so I've always loved storage. Good. Okay. So we will be having Lucas back at some point to talk about uh, what's coming in storage. Because obviously there's a lot going on. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So uh, for now, Lucas, thanks for being here. 
Julia, thanks for being here. Thank you. Quick reminder, if you're watching us on the YouTube channel, please subscribe to the channel so you can follow along with the different episodes and uh, see what's coming up. Uh, for now, I think that'll do it. Thanks for watching.